All right. Thanks for coming out. Um, I know we're not on the poster, but um, it's a great opportunity anyway to um, welcome two um, architects to uh, Los Angeles and to UCLA. Uh, it just happens that uh, Francois Chabonnet and um, Patrick Heiz are here for their studio visit uh, with their students from the Teja in Zurich. Um, they're principals of uh, an excellent architecture company called Made In in Geneva. Um, and they teach in Surrey. And I met uh, Francois and Patrick in 2016 in Detroit. Um, and uh, we were part of a common kind of working together in a workshop called uh, Infrastructure Space. I don't remember the sub theme. Yeah. Oh, can you not hear anymore? It was feedback, so. So, Infrastructure Space. Um, and I remember being super impressed with the work. Um, and generally, I loved the fun that you guys have um, in a sometimes all too serious uh, field, you know? It's nice to see people having fun. Um, they were invited and I think they discussed a bunch of the projects that you might see today, but the one that I remember really sticking with me was this hydraulic construction on the lake uh, in Geneva. Um, Geneva, right? Um, which is kind of an amazing vision for the, that city's future where they played with uh, water, wind, climate, um, and generally I think the sort of environmental and infrastructural objects of the Alps. And it was so intelligent and playful um, that uh, when I heard that you guys were here, I knew it would be a perfect opportunity to invite you to come have a talk. Um, and thank you both for coming in, thanks Francois, you'll be presenting this evening. So just by way of introduction so that you know where they're coming from, uh, because uh, there's a, you know, architects, I don't know how old you are, but probably like there. <laughs> so that's young for an architect, um, as we all know. Um, and uh, they both studied um, at the Swiss Federal Institute of um, Technology at the in Zurich. Um, I think that maybe Francois, you spent some time in New York um, and then moved back to Switzerland, to Basel, to work with Herzog de Meuron. Um, and that's where Patrick was already working, I think, you know? Um, and uh, I asked uh, in leading into this introduction what projects they worked on, because for us, that's the blockbuster um, stuff that we look at in the magazines. Um, and I, uh, it was Ian Schrager's Aster Hotel, which was a collaboration between um, OMA and Herzog de Meuron. And I remember thinking, I'm a New Yorker, so for me that was, uh, wow, that is going to be something cool in on Astor Place. And um, the idea that this would be a giant block of Swiss cheese uh, by um, a collaboration between a Swiss uh, and, and a Dutch seemed a bit um, like I knew that wasn't going to work out, but it turned out that <laughs> it was probably 9-11 that really uh, sacked that one. Um, I was super excited about that, and then um, the, it was called the Hosanna Winery. Is that the one you worked on, Patrick? The, it's actually the same client uh, as the client for um, Do, uh, Dominus. Yeah. Um, uh, but this is maybe the best extrusion project I've ever seen. Uh, it's really a brilliant uh, diagram, one that we're now familiar with, um, like a section extrusion. Um, it's a really beautiful thing. It wasn't fully realized, but I guess the refectory was. Um, and then after working there for some number of years, I guess two or three years, something like that, they founded Made In in 2003 um, in Geneva. And they've won innumerable, innumerable awards, but include the Swiss Art Award. They were nominated for the Chernikov uh, Prize. Um, they, again, I think nominated for Velu and um, all kinds of stuff, actually. And the one that I thought was uh, amazing, uh, really beautiful project that I, I have great fondness for is the Chardon Villa, um, which uh, is just on the lake, or just above the lake, which has some pretty spectacular views from the bathroom, right? <laughs> Not only the bathroom, but also the bathroom, yeah. Anyway, it's, um, it, it's, if you have had a chance to check out the website, that's also a beautifully designed website, as you would expect nothing less from a Swiss, um, but it's, uh, it's really a, a captivating group of projects. Um, you guys are some of the funniest um, and um, uh, really just pleasant uh, architects to listen to. So um, I'm so pl pleased that you could make time for us here and, and welcome to UCLA.
So. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Michael. Can you hear me fine? It's fine. All right. Um, well, I want to thank you for the invitation to be, have the opportunity to actually present our work here at UCLA in California. It means quite a lot to us. And uh, we've been looking to that, to that moment for quite a few years now since we met in Detroit. So I'm very happy to be here. On behalf of Maiden here, I'm presenting also my associate, uh, Patrick Hyde, on the right side of the picture. Uh, <laughs> Uh, to point out to what actually this picture was actually uh, produced when we were asked by a magazine um, to stand in front of one of our buildings in order to promote, I don't know, what kind of an architecture we would do and then stand kind of dumbly in front of our buildings and we said, no, there's no way we're going to do this, we have to promote something else. And in this image, of course, we're trying to say that it's more uh, the association of a competence, uh, of two competences, but not only, it has also uh, the, the, the space conquest. Of course, it does not compare, architecture does not compare with the space conquest, but uh, I think there is something in common is that a project is something, kind of a sort of a project that you throw uh, and give it a trajectory and a speed, and at a certain point, there's a lot of an uncertainty factor in the field of architecture, and I think we should consider the project as a kind of a, an adventurous uh, 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 matter and not only something about controlling. So therefore, there is an uncertainty in developing architecture, which I think is central to our practice. Um, so from that to the first image of the house that we built uh, around the Lake of Geneva. Again, this was also the first publication for the house, which was actually not finished as such. But it's interesting that we placed it on the moon not only uh, uh, for the sake of the slogan that you see up there, because it was a fashion magazine, so we didn't really know how to really promote the house in a fashion magazine. And instead of doing a kind of a pseudo-scientific approach to what the house would be, we proposed to actually uh, fully embrace the magazine, the fashion magazine uh, uh, perspective and say, okay, we're going to just build up a, kind of an image associated with a slogan. And uh, here it says some don't work with the same gravity, but the, the point is also to show that this is, the structure of the house is really going to be, as you will see later on on the images, the house itself. Uh, this is house is set uh, on a very spectacular uh, site close to the lake uh, Le Lac Léman, the Lake of Geneva, in English, and it's a very spectacular site. It's now UN protected, um, UNESCO protected site. Uh, the vineyards are extremely beautiful and extremely spectacular. Also, they give a look onto the lake, as we will see later on. But this is also to show where this house is actually set. This is the first flat roof house on the municipality of Chardon, and it's probably going to be one of the last one, probably. <laughs> but um, I wanted to point out to what this house was, actually was developed in 2008. And it is, you could say, in a certain way, a glass house. But actually, I don't know if I have a pointer. Could I, could I is there a way to actually to have perhaps a pointer? What I want to point out to is that um, it is a glass house, but instead of a glass house, I think we should consider it as like four glass houses next to each other. Uh, so what you can see here is basically the structure and the infrastructure and the organization of the whole house. And instead of this, you know, modernist type of a glass house typology where a center core would allow for space around to develop the program around a central, a central core. Here what you organize is actually four houses next to each other. Yes, thank you very much. Yes. So four units, really, an infrastructural one and then four units, the master bedroom, the entrance and the visitor's bedroom the kitchen and the dining room and the living room. And these parts are actually separated houses through a system of sliding doors that you could activate and create actually a huge avalanche as we will see later on. Um, so this is not a modernist house in that sense. So it's not really a, a modernist glass house as such, but really the association of different uh, chambers next to each other. This is the front chamber, as you can see here, facing the spectacular um, uh, view over the Alps. This is actually the other side. This is France. On the other side, this is the Lake, uh, Lake Geneva. And this is really the, uh, the space that you actually experience when you are into the living room of the house. Uh, this is one uh, of the, it's actually the master bedroom. This is, you were actually saying there was a beautiful view from the bathroom. It's not exactly a view, but actually a series of uh, layering of competences that allow for a certain transparency and the breathing of the space itself instead of actually having solid walls separating the things. So 
actually, in order to guarantee the privacy of the house, we have set a series of uh, layering of expertise, allowing for a certain privacy to take place into this house, and at the same time, having this transversality and transversality of the, um, of the, of the glass space. You can see here in the section, here how the house is actually organized. You can see the four chambers here. And you can see also the, how the structure is actually set onto, onto the house. What is interesting perhaps to see here is that the structure itself defines really the house organization, nothing else. So it is not only just the organization, but also the image of the house itself, as you can see here on this image. It was an early, I don't know if it's me who is ventilating or it's, oh, okay. So the house is set here on a very hilly landscape. And what happened actually, the reason for which it actually flows over the site is that we were asked by the clients to actually have a, uh, a house that will allow to exploit really this site. So it's a thousand square meter site. And uh, basically the footprint of the house with such a, a staging of the structure allows for a thousand meter uh, exploitation of the site itself. So therefore the footprint is really reduced to almost zero. Here's a side view of the house with its uh, retractable staircase as kind of a sign of the occupancy of the house. So in this case, the house is completely closed. No one can access the house and the privacy is at its maximum limit. Here's another view. And what I want to point out too here through this section is how slender and how difficult it was actually to actually set all the fixtures inside this slender construction in order for the steel structure to appear as really not only just the structure but also the house as an image. And you can see here, we've used a special steel structure that was used for parking lots and was developed by ThyssenKrupp, which is a German firm, um, and allowing actually through these, uh, I don't know how you call these actually in, in, in English, but these uh, Unterzug, to allow for actually the infrastructure to take place into this. The system of sliding doors, as I said, was organized in order to guarantee a quite accurate ventilation. You can see here there is behind the structure a set of louvers that you can activate electrically and that allows actually uh, the, the, the air to take speed into the house and through the system of sliding doors to actually accurately ventilate the house. And this is when all the sliding doors are open, you create actually a very French axis, the enfilade, which allows actually a relationship between all the different chambers of the house. So you could say that it is a pretty strict structure, but of course, if you were to look at the cross section, then everything is set in question again. Uh, the structure itself stretches to the most, uh, uttermost limit of the site in order to guarantee an exploitation underneath the house itself and guarantee uh, the widest exploitation of that site. You can see here also how the stair is actually uh, being brought up as a sign of the occupancy. I will come back to that. This is another view. So the stair, as I said, is a sign of the occupancy of the house. It's a very little house. All in all, it's 150 square meters. So I don't know exactly how many square feet that is, about times 10, right? 15, 1,500. That would be about something like that, 1,500 square square feet. And uh, the idea was to actually to give a certain monumentality to that entrance to this small house, but also guarantee a sort of visibility of how this would be activated as such. You know, is there anyone in the house or not? So the house is really literally detached from its own ground. And by this activation of this staircase, you would allow actually to be, uh, to be uh, able to read whether the house was occupied or not. And strangely enough, this staircase was not really used later on, which is actually a good news because we, we love the misuse of uh, actually what we plan. And in this case, we realized that in the summer when it's really hot, they pull up the stair halfway and leave the doors open so that actually the house cannot be uh, really uh, accessed but can be ventilated more drastically when it's really hot in the summer. And this is when the stair is pulled down, this kind of a sort of monumental entrance to this small house, but also very welcoming uh, pathway to the middle of the, uh, uh, of the house itself. The second project I want to talk about is a project that was developed in 2008, I think, also at the same time as we finished that house. We were asked by a municipality, a um, municipality in uh, uh, actually set between, the, I don't know if you know about this, but the longest tunnel in the world was actually finished last year in Switzerland. It's about 57 kilometers long. And uh, it is set between Ersfeld and, and uh, Biasca. 
57 kilometers, and it's going to actually place Zurich about two and a half hours away from Milan, so it's really an acceleration. But here's what happens when they build that tunnel. You can see how it actually they started to build. They build actually from one side to the other side, start on, the, on either side of the, of the mountain, and also in the center. And this is actually, this municipality, this little village here, which actually has something that is unique in the world, because this is about 800 meter high of granite. This is a really a hole, which is about 15 meter in diameter, set directly into the, into the granite, and that actually brings you down. The workers actually working here, there are people working there and there, of course, going this way and that way, but also in the center. So they started here, so they go into the, the mountain. There's a huge lift that drops actually into the thing. Here, down there, it's, the temperature oscillates between 35 and 55 degrees Celsius. There is such a powerful ventilation that you can't hear yourself, so you have to wear like headphones and follow your guide in order to actually visit. We had the chance to, to actually visit this thing. And of course, we are absolutely fascinated by those machines that actually, that, uh, actually are able to, to dig such holes. And you also get to know that there is, each country has its own specificities. So the best drillers vertically are the Italians, the original best drillers are South Africans, and so on. So there's a whole consortium, actually, of competences that are needed, actually, to build up such a tunnel. Nothing new technologically, really, but uh, it's just the longest tunnel in the world. That's what it is, right? Uh, okay, the reason for which uh, I point out to this is that we were asked by this, uh, this little town to say, okay, what is it going to happen with this whole 800-meter hole? Uh, when the tunnel is finished. And they say, that we have something unique here, and we don't know what to do with it, so you have to, you know, tell us what to do with it. So the Confederation had an idea, they wanted to actually make an underground train station so that the people from Zurich could take their ski boots directly from the city of Zurich and directly get on the slopes, right? And there was a lot of discussion, they were really planning to do that, they never did it, so uh, they never did it. So this municipality asked a series of architects to actually promote ideas for that where five architects were invited to take part to that, um, uh, to that not competition, but that study. And uh, all of them actually proposed to come down, to go down into the hole and to watch the train pass by. And I thought that's a little bit uh, awkward, actually, to go down a hole, about a kilometer down into the granite, and to watch this tra the train pass by, that won't stop. So we said, we need to find another idea, another poetic idea, I think. Uh, and what you see here in this area is really what we call the Urschweiz. So this is really the first cantons, the first states that aggregated themselves. It's kind of a primarily, uh, primordial state. This is the origin of Switzerland, really. And of course, the landscape is absolutely fascinating. This is a very, very the center of the core of the Alps. And uh, so we started to investigate on how we could actually use this hole. And we realized that in the past, of course, the Alphorn uh, was not an instrument. It was a tool to actually communicate between the shepherds among, you know, throughout, throughout the Alps. So therefore, they could gather the flocks and also communicate with uh, the other shepherds of the other valleys through the echo. The echo, which became, of course, a topic uh, all of a sudden uh, through the project. And we said, here's what we're going to do. Instead of bringing the people down, we're going to drill up the last 400 meters up to the surface of the mountain, so the whole hole would actually be about 1,200 meters high. We're gonna actually instigate here, uh, promote a device, and when the train passes into the town, the shock waves would actually move, trigger the device, and you know, actually, actually move the air particles all the way to the top of the mountains. When the train passes, the mountain screams out its own joy of actually having a train passing by. So it will work as a sort of a theatrical way of actually sign, you know, a sign. And uh, the, the national uh, exhibition would have had to take place in a few years, I think, around this area. So it would have been a very beautiful way to actually evoke the Alphorn as a kind of a tool to actually communicate something. And turn, of course, the city and uh, the village of Cedrun as a kind of a gigantic arena to actually witness uh, that particular moment. That's it. <laughs> The third project I want to talk about is a project we like very much that you mentioned also, uh, uh, Michael. It is said as if this is the city of Geneva we have, uh, where we have our office. You all know probably this little part of Geneva at least. This is the largest lake in Europe. And this is one of the largest river in Europe. This all the, all, goes all the way down to, uh, to Marseille, uh, into the Mediterranean Sea. This is the Rhone. 
uh, along with the Rhine, is one of the largest rivers in Europe. And the specificity of Geneva is, of course, that not only set at the end of the lake, unlike Zurich, the city of Geneva is part of the lake. It's a very different situation. I think Zurich has a completely different situation for its own city. It's really at the end of the lake, but here in this case, the city of Geneva is really part of the lake and embraces it. Uh, there's a specific name for that. It's called La Rade and the Petit Lac that actually surrounds uh, is, uh, surround that lake. Uh, of course, like any other city built around a river, there's a whole series of bridges and crosses and infrastructure allowing uh, uh, for the link between the two sides of the rivers. But there's also this huge bridge here that was built post-war uh, and that actually accommodates for traffic. This is not the only city where you get, there's a lot of traffic. Geneva is a very small city compared to Los Angeles, but there are 60,000 cars passing on this bridge every day, and it's an absolute nightmare to go from one side to the other. So therefore, they launched a competition to actually uh, uh, set a pedestrian way uh, alongside this thing. We thought that was kind of an awkward uh, proposal because there are a lot of bridges, as I showed on the previous image here, there are a lot of bright bridges actually allowing for pedestrians to go from one side to the other. But what we thought is that we would kind of investigate what the history of this shore were. Geneva is really characterized, it's called the Cité des Parcs. So uh, in Switzerland, it has this absolutely wonderful English parks, right? Uh, uh, and these were actually uh, built up by arist aristocratic societies in the 18th and 19th century. And the reason for which we call it the city park, they are of course most, mostly English gardens, but they are actually at the time where um, they would exchange very rare essences of trees. And therefore we have in those parks extreme, uh, extreme essences of trees that you would not find under our latitudes. So you have redwoods, you have things like that. So they would exchange actually seeds of extremely precious and you have extremely wild, wild, uh, uh, wild parks there. But they were all, of course, private parks, you know, uh, dedicated to the aristocratic families. Later on, uh, these aristocratic families actually gave this to the population and, uh, uh, and to the city of Geneva. This is the first one. This is the Parc Montrepo, which is on the uh, eastern part of the city. And you can see here, this is the English garden with actually an accommodation of the shore. This is about 1878. So this is 30 years after the modern confederation is founded. Later on, you see here the Parc des Ovis, very close to where our office is. This is also an English garden that was also set and given to the population. But you also see here the extension of how the shore was actually worked upon in order to create a sort of a huge promenade. So if you see it from the, really from the beginning of that promenade all the way to the other side, you would be at about eight mile promenade. But there is a missing part here, right? And this is really at the core of the project. We wanted to actually embrace this classical opportunity to actually finish that classical promenade all the way around the side and not to stage it in a way that would be kind of a little passerelle, that would be a structural, you know, like a tour de force, but something that would complete that 19th century uh, uh, investigation of the shores. And this is what we did. This is the project itself. So it's a special infrastructure. You can see here how it is. And this was actually the depth of the site. Most of the, the competitors actually proposed a very structural way of staging this passerelle. And we said, we're going to embrace the whole depth, really, of the site that was given to us and get as close as possible to what roads and the main road is. It allows for actually a splitting, an extremely efficient splitting of the different flows uh, uh, that take place on that side. So you have the cars here, the pedestrian on the other side, the large territorial impact and you know, platform that allows and dedicated to the pedestrian on the view, to the most beautiful views that you have in Geneva and to the Mont Blanc, which is the highest mountain in Europe, and the lake, which is a very spectacular view. But nowadays, people and tourists actually gather on this little sidewalk here where bikers need to actually use this because it's so dangerous to cross it. There's so much traffic. And the road is really bad. So therefore, you have tourists here, you have bikers, you have pedestrians that actually conflicting interest. Uh, some of them wants to stop, some others wants to cross, and it doesn't work. So therefore, we said we're going to embrace this whole territory and propose a new kind of infrastructure that will allow for this splitting of different flows. So you have now the bikes actually set behind the new infrastructure, the whole front ter frontal territory completing the 19th century promenade into a huge uh, infrastructural, uh, pedestrian infrastructure, or the cars stay where they are, and on the other side you have no change to the actual uh, uh, pedestrian areas. It's an infrastructure, and I said I wanted to speak about this infrastructure, so how it really works and what kind of a you know, performance it addresses, not only in terms of landscaping, but also really what it promotes as a performative aspect of this infrastructure. 
And here's what we have. Every year, one of the largest fireworks in Europe is set uh, uh, on fire, literally, over the lake in August. So you have about 250,000 people gathering around the lake to watch this about 45 minute an hour show. And it, don't ask me whether I like it or not, this is happening every year. So this is something that they have to set a provisional infrastructure every year in order to actually accommodate these 250,000 people. In this case, through the section, you would see that you would actually naturally set a kind of a set, uh, stance. And therefore, for the, uh, for the sake of this uh, uh, kind of festival, actually, the form itself would allow for uh, a temporary and provisional infrastructure that would meet the requirements at this time. Uh, I want to point out also to this, actually, how this works. We'll come back to that. Uh, of course, as any city around, uh, located around rivers, you had these with these, I don't know how you call these, these kind of the water wheels actually allowing for the infrastructural help uh, for the grains and so on to actually work. And uh, we said it would be, this is the modern version of it, this is the turbine, and we said it would be very beautiful to re reactivate this in a certain way. So here's what it is. The structure itself is a very simple uh, concrete structure, you know, like concrete walls set uh, 50 meters apart from each other. And then you have here a floater. So basically this whole, this whole pipe here is like a kind of a floater and, and adjusting actually to the level of the lake. The level of the lake hop, you know, oscillate between meter 50 and plus minus meter 50 around the year. And so this infrastructure here would be set at the height of the lake itself, creating kind of a resistance through a system of gears. So there's here a resistance and allowing for the production of electricity. Therefore, the system itself, a very basic system of resistance, would allow for electricity to be produced and therefore to promote uh, 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 the lighting of the bridge itself. It goes beyond that. In the winter, there's a very nasty wind taking place in Geneva, uh, where you almost sometimes you know, uh, you know, kind of doubt whether you want to cross or not. This is overnight. You can wake up and at some point, this is what you have as a result. So the water, the rain, and the wind freezes everything overnight. And this is what the very spectacular view you have something almost every other year in Geneva. And of course, uh, through the geometry of it, the wind will be deflected and allowing for a protective area here behind the thing. This is the third part of the performative aspect of this bridge. And then finally, of course, the traffic itself being a major, I don't teach you anything about traffic, you know a lot about it in this town. Um, but uh, we would like to actually work on a kind of a sound bearer. And therefore, by means of this rotating and this gear that we actually implemented into the bridge itself, you would allow for actually a kind of a sound bearer by means of what? By the creation of a horizontal uh, monument, which would be like huge waterfall on the other side of the thing. Therefore, the waterfall would counteract the, the noise of the bridge itself. So this, this bridge is not a bridge in itself. It's more than that. It performs on several levels. And this is how interesting we thought it was to actually stage again kind of a horizontal pendant to what the water fountain, the vertical fountain, water fountain is. It was badly uh, received for the very reason also that it took place a few months after uh, the tsunami in Japan. And therefore, they thought we were cynical about this. But this is as we had raised, really, the level of the lake on the other side and give a pendant to the vertical fountain. The fourth project is a um, project for the hockey stadium. Yeah, um, <laughs> I don't want to teach you anything about hockey. You guys know a lot about hockey. I usually tend to actually uh, present this image to point out to one thing. Hockey is an extremely physical sport. And it's really at the center of really any hockey player would tell you that this is not just the result of what hockey is, of course, but this is the physicality of it. Uh, it's cold steel contacts. The players stay on the ice for less than two minutes and then they have to change. The it's so physically intense that uh, we wanted to actually portrait that kind of thing. So instead of doing just an arena for any kind of a sport, we wanted to do an arena, a very specific arena, which would actually deal with this issue of hockey as such. And it's another infrastructure I want to speak about because uh, it's set on a very specific area in Zurich where the competition uh, uh, brief did not allow to go beyond minus four meters at, uh, underneath the ground level because there is a river uh, that actually crosses uh, this part of the city. And you have here also, this is a very strange and awkward site because it's set between two major infrastructure. This is the main railroad leading to the center of the city and this is the main expressway leading to the center of the city. 
So there's a kind of a breach, and this, this, this object here, which is set next to what we call Schrebergärten. Schrebergärten are very small gardens, actually, it's dedicated to people who want to cultivate uh, their tomatoes over the weekend or spend some their time with their own private uh, garden. And there was a huge question whether actually this uh, size of an infrastructure could take place next to this. It is now being built by another office who won the project, Adam Caruso, but this is our contribution to the competition. We wanted to actually organize, there was a parking lot that needed to be actually developed around the site, and we said instead of actually hiding the cars, we're going to develop a parking lot set between uh, the two main infrastructures that would allow actually to stage a link between the northern part of the city and the southern part of the city, because right now the infrastructure would be actually totally devoid of any contact with the northern part of the city. So by means of this gigantic, let's say, park, parking infrastructure off-ground, we would allow for the people from the northern part of the city to actually uh, join this area. Uh, this is the floor plan uh, of the ground floor, and actually the reflection we had is that in a stadium, the only place where the maximum amount of people here, it's about 12,000 people uh, stadium, where the 12,000 people would potentially meet would be the ground floor. Literally afterwards, in any stadium, the people actually gathered, you know, and are uh, you know, set around the different stands and heights. And therefore, they were asking for a 1,500 square meter uh, lobby space, but we said it would be very beautiful to actually stage it in a different way, and we offered them a triple uh, of that, and therefore a 4,500 square meter lobby space where 12,000 people could literally gather on a single level and not to be actually uh, uh, spread on several other levels. So therefore, really, the idea would to say that at the ground floor, the base of the object would be at its widest in order to accommodate those 12,000 people. But there's more to this. In Europe, at least, I don't know how the fans are here, but they are extremely not only just violent on the ice, but also outside of the ice. And for there are a lot of security reasons. During the games, nets are being pulled up between different fans, uh, zones, you know, uh, uh, the beer cans not to land on the ice and so on. So this is really a serious question of security. The different team fans cannot meet one another. And here's what we did. We actually set a row that would bring actually the player in a kind of a very uh, monumental way inside the structure itself. But what you can't see here, because we haven't drawn the shadows, is that this was actually going down, creating sort of a ditch into the thing, and therefore creating an island. So well, the fans, from the visiting fans, actually set onto an island and actually are, can never in contact with the other by means of this structure, and therefore actually guaranteeing the security to take place. Well, on the other side, you have just one tribune for the press, one tribune for the uh, main, uh, for the visitors, and one tribune for actually, not for the visitor, for the common, uh, common people, and uh, on the other side, the tribune of the Zurich team. The section I was talking about, this is really the widest part of the building itself, you can see, that's why, where in the lobby you can actually set the 12,000 people. It's actually not just one arena, but it's two arena. And the arena, the main arena, actually staged as a bridge over the small arena for the second team. Thing. So this is here of the four meters I was talking about. And the people actually are directly shot up, directly in the middle of the main arena. They don't go up by means of steps, but they're actually brought through by means of these escalators directly in the middle of the arena. Half of them go down into the arena, and the other half goes up into the arena. Now the players, they're on skates, so you can't ask them to actually go up into the arena by means of stairs, so therefore, you know, it's over an homage to our mentor, you were mentioning Astor Place, this is the lift of the villa in uh, Bordeaux by, by Rem Colas and OMA, and we thought it would be very beautiful to have those 45 players actually set onto one single platform being brought up into the main arena as kind of a gladiators, right? As, you know, as, as a very theatrical way to actually, and this is, there's a, actually a rule, and visitors are always coming on the ice first, right? So they were brought up into the main arena, and you can see here, during halftime, this is the lower part of the small arena, they would meet the press halfway down, between the lockers and the arena itself, and here actually meet the press and exchange with the press itself. The other part, which would be absolutely central to the project itself, is that in any stadium today, the slope of the stands, the amount, the space between each seat is given. So therefore, no architecture can be really defined by that. But there's one thing which is left to the decision of the architect, is really how to deal with the corner. How do you deal with the corner of an arena, whether actually which are the most problematic uh, seats in the whole arena? And 
I'm pointing out that this image, usually there would be a sound. You see this icon right there? There would be a sound to point out to what the arena is really. A hockey arena really vibrates with an extreme atmosphere, which you can never find in football, for example, at least not in Europe. And uh, for having experience also a hockey game also in the US, I think this is also something extremely central to that. The reason for which I point out to this is that we wanted to actually get rid of those most difficult seats and guarantee actually the whole space itself to resonate from that, from, from, that, from the atmosphere. Therefore, we left the worst seats completely open in order the arena, not just the main arena, but the whole infrastructure to resonate from the atmosphere itself. You can see here our two friends are still fighting, but here the corners here are completely open in order for the arena itself uh, to resonate. It resonates not only because of its open corners, but also because of its materiality. This is basically a, a eight millimeter thick steel uh, structure and cladding, and there is no absorbing material in the whole arena. Therefore, it will make it really an absolutely an, uh, fantastic experience. Uh, we kept the helicopter platform of the oil rig. This is <laughs> a Gazprom oil rig platform that is set in the Arctic Sea. Uh, during the game, at game time, uh, we would brought up the lions because the lion is the icon of the Zurich Lions. So at game time, the old lion of the zoo will be brought up onto the platform as a sign of the occupancy of the arena itself. The fifth project I want to show, this is the, uh, almost, not the last one, but the, uh, is, um, was a competition launched in 2012 for um, a series of pavilions that were actually um, developing around the topics of um, Claude Nobs. Claude Nobs was the founder of the Monto Jazz Festival. He died a few years ago, but he was there at the time. He really, uh, and Claude Nobs has a collection, a very interesting collection of um, concerts that you all mostly know about, but he is not allowed to actually promote them uh, commercially. He has to promote them into specific areas, and therefore he got in touch with uh, the president of the EPFL, which is the panda, the French part of the panda of the ETH in Zurich, and uh, asked them whether they would be interested to actually stage kind of a series of pavilions in order to be able to play that music and to show it, to share. And for us, it made no sense at all, as much as we love the music uh, promoted by Claude Knopf's in development, how we would actually bring this techno technological school and ambition of the school with an art form, which had nothing to do with technology as such. But Claude Knopf was really fascinated by technology. And we thought, okay, there is perhaps a link to be found there. But we very, very quickly realized that this technological uh, uh, link between his kind of fantasy for technology and uh, gadgets and so on, and the technology that was developed at the EPFL would be too, too shallow and would lead to kind of a dead end. Because technology is, of course, bound to its own fate to become obsolete very quickly. Therefore, we were looking for something else. That was one point that we questioned in the program. And not only, because they were also mentioning the fact that they were talking about pavilions. The pavilions, in a way that we use as a word, kind of a, kind of a withdrawal, you know, they didn't really point out to what a pavilion was. Therefore, what we ask is that we also said what, how a pavilion could be, could be read, and we went back to what a word means, pavilion, etymologically. And we realized that this would, very, very, would really become a very beautiful program, because a pavilion is several things. Of course, it's not just in the field of architecture. In the field of architecture, it's a smaller building. It's a small building, so it means that there is a larger pavilion in a certain way. And the larger pavilion on the EPFL compound is the obvious one, is the one by SANA, which is the Rolex Learning Center. So for us, it was extremely important that any pavilion that we would develop would remain kind of a, you know, smaller and more modest than the pavilion by SANA. That was a kind of a, not a moralistic approach to it, but really also then kind of, uh, an ambition of the project itself. Secondary building, that's one thing. And then we realized that the pavilion, historically speaking, is always set onto a compound which is much larger than the limits of its own body. Therefore, the influence uh, uh, of, the, of the pavilion itself extends way beyond uh, uh, the limit of its own body. It is always set in a larger compound. In this case, it's as much a goal as a point of view. So it's a goal you know, that you can see into the landscape and it's also a part of a point of view from which you can actually witness the, what the landscape is. Therefore, the site itself of the pavilions should be much larger than its own body. That's the second part of the program. And then in music, it's a transmitter. This is something you use to actually, you know, uh, uh, to expand and uh, extend uh, the impact of the sound. And in medicine, 
It's part of the ear, so it's a receiver. That's another part of the program. And finally, a pavilion in French is also a flag that is set onto boats, therefore it's a sign. And that's really about the program that we were actually finding really essential to the whole program, uh, to the to the whole project. So it's a sign, it's a transmitter, it's a receiver, uh, it's a smaller pavilion, and it's set into a larger compound than its own body. And then, as I said, we were very questioning, we're very doubtful about the idea of technology because of its own obsolescence uh, that comes all too quickly. And instead of doing, you know, staging uh, technology, we said we would try to stage kind of general law. Therefore, a speed of sound in a given medium, that would be really what the base of what we would be working on. And then we realized that sound was actually uh, uh, kind of an interesting way to, uh, to deal with also geometry because you can have concave uh, reflectors, convex reflectors. And we found out that there were this uh, very playful way of dealing with this system called uh, acoustic mirrors. Acoustic mirrors were more serious than they appear to be. Uh, this is really uh, between the two world wars. The British were extremely anxious about the Germans and they were developing, before, uh, before uh, uh, the radar was invented, they were inventing, uh, trying to investigate on how to listen to the sound uh, uh, of the sky. And they were very serious about this. You can see here a series of uh, extremely spectacular acoustic devices. Um, uh, these are authentic images. They are not comic books. This is my favorite one. <laughs> and the thing is that they were really successful. They could really listen to what this guy was saying. They couldn't just make the difference between a pigeon crashing on a tree and a, an airplane attacking uh, London. Therefore, it was really dropped early on when the radar was invented. Uh, but uh, it was a serious thing. And you could see there were a very beautiful structure in the southern part of England developed. Uh, and they are still up to, you know, you can still visit them. They are very wonderful structures. And they are all acoustic devices in order to listen to what this guy then Claude Knops was also, that we realized later on, Claude Knops was also at the time in the 60s, the CEO of Time Warner Cable. Yes, he was. And um, Time Warner Cable is really interesting. You can see here it's an eye and an ear. These are the two senses you need to promote any sort of education, right? Before any kind of other uh, senses, you would need at least a sight and an ear to actually promote kind of a transmission of education. It was a very beautiful program into an institution like that, that of the EPFL. I won't, I would just, you know, don't insist onto that, the biometric, of course, that the ear itself was used in the 18th century, you know, you know kind of a dreadfully also used later on uh, in the 20th centuries by the, uh, by the Germans, but also this anthropometric thing. They were not even the two, uh, two twins have the same kind of a ear pavilion. So it was used very, very early on as a kind of a tool to identify before the DNA was found out before the fingerprints, and not even twins have the same kind of ear pavilions. So therefore, the specificity would be actually at the center also of the, each of the pavilions. This is the first pavilion, which is called the Welcome Pavilion, which is not game, uh, uh, given by us, but by the program, which is a reflecting wall, as you can see, but it's also infrastructure actually closing this kind of an unsatisfactory situation where the esplanade, which is set higher here on the higher ground at the APFO, you would have to know really the site precisely in order to appreciate this, but this is actually allowing for this to become a plaza and not just an esplanade. And you can see here, this pavilion allows for uh, an exhibition of what the competences of the APFL is, as kind of an entrance gate to uh, the compound itself. This is the central pavilion, where actually, uh, it's called the Sound Lab, where uh, groups of musical groups are actually perform on a daily basis where cafe and a restaurant would take place. But it's also a sound lab. And we used actually the gasometer, I kind of, kind of last farewell to the, to the oil industry and then the gas industry and the fossil industries as kind of beautiful structure. And this would turn into a real, uh, a real laboratory because you can actually send, uh, change the volume actually of the sound laboratory itself. So we took really the program almost word to word extremely seriously. And you can see here that uh, Every year, 15,000 students gather on this esplanade to, uh, they come from all over Switzerland and gather for this, what they call Balelec, which is one of the largest student uh, party time uh, of the year. And here, we want it to be a bit ironic. Of course, here today, the rock band has disappeared. There should be a rock band here. The whole structure is basically the gasometer itself. 
And it turns out to be that today we actually visit those iconic buildings and kind of uh, like rock bands. And this is a criticality we wanted to address. This is a farewell to the fossil energies, but at the same time, also a critical point of view to what architecture as it is perceived today. Um, you can see how the main uh, pavilion works. You have here a transmitter, the transmitter was talking about, and here a series of, uh, you know, uh, implemented like uh, Russian puppets, puppets actually that can develop and change the volume of the uh, of the system itself, of the laboratory itself. This is one of the laboratory on top. This is the restaurants where the stage is being uh, activated or the concert to take place. And the last one is an art pavilion. There was also the Confederation as a collection of art, and they wanted to implement this collection and to show it around uh, the different universities in Switzerland. And of course, this was the most audacious part because uh, it was really badly received that we actually dared to implement such a hill onto this landmark. The reason for which we did that is that you now experience the vaults of the SANA project here, underneath the vaults, inside the vaults, but you never see this wonderful landscape which is on top of it. And we wanted to create a point of view allowing for this to take place. You can see here the main pavilion, and here one of the receivers plus the hill where the students would gather. The reason for which actually we set it also here in the center is that this shape here is a potato shape, but it's so big that you, you don't really know what kind of a shape it is. You don't know whether it's a perfect circle, whether it's an ellipse or anything like this. And the only way to reveal that is we, in contrast, to place a very platonic and extremely ideal shape into it in order to actually create the distance that will allow and reveal the discrepancies of that shape. I was talking about the site, the fact that a pavilion is always set into a compound which is larger than its own body. This is actually the given side of the competition. So we said, this is way too small. We have to investigate the whole side of the APFL and propose to actually set different receivers on the different part of the compounds. So the main transmitter, the laboratory here, would actually send sound waves to these receivers. And at the converging point, you would hear the music. So you could be a kilometer away from the infrastructure, it works perfectly well, and actually cross this beam of, of, uh, of uh, sound, sound waves, and actually here at the converging point you would hear the music itself. You could cross it somewhere else and not hear anything, but at the converging point you would sit uh, and hear the music. This is one of the receiver pavilion, and we would have worked, actually mobilized in the whole competences of the school in order to build up such a device, because there would be uh, a lot of studies to be done about materiality and how what kind of how kind of sort of geometries would allow for the spreading of the sound or concentrating or focusing on the sound itself. And the last project I want to show you today is uh, one for a museum, a competition that was held in Lausanne for the new museum des Beaux Arts, um, developed in 2011, and it is set in a very interesting site in Lausanne. This is the main station at the core of the city itself which is here, and this is a private property owned by the main railroad company in Switzerland, which is almost has a monopoly called the CFF, or the SBB. And this is a private site at the moment, well, not anymore because the new museum has been built since then, but at the time it was a private ground that you could not access because it was reserved for uh, maintenance of the trains, actually. And it works perfectly as such, uh, as long as it's held away from the urban tissue or the urban fabric itself. But then they proposed to actually open it and turn into a, a public program. And actually, this building here, which is called the uh, uh, 1911, which was built in 1911, as a kind of a landmark building. And we had a huge problem with this because we thought that, as I said, you know, as long as it is set, kept at, outside of the urban fabric, there's no problem with that, uh, that help. But once it is really implemented as part of the public program, then it creates kind of a barrier between the eastern part of the city and the western part of the city. And we thought the quality of the building itself was really questionable. Therefore, instead of keeping the substance as such, and kind of a landmark, usual landmark way of dealing with those, uh, with those objects, we said we're going to keep the spirit or the function of it. We're going to keep it as an infrastructure. And therefore, we propose several ways to deal with it. We'll come back to that. But I want to come back to perhaps the way we actually try to transmit uh, the project itself. So I would say there were several levels onto which we could communicate architecture as architects. One of them would be drawings. And drawings are scale representations. I don't want to go into detail what the project is, but the project is not an object. The project for the museum is the creation of a new street. 
which would allow for a new link between the eastern part of the city and the western part of the city, which was actually part of the brief, actually. Huh? But it also stages every interstitial space allowing for a link, a radical link between the northern part of the city, which is extremely topographic in Lausanne, and the southern part of the city. You can see here we have staged a direct link, a most direct link between two, uh, two urban structures here, allowing for this escalator to actually reach as fast as possible the lower part of the city on the other side of the train tracks. The building itself at the ground floor has a minimal footprint or this ground here to be kept as a completely infrastructural space and to be activated as a kind of a pathway between the eastern part and the western part. Uh, at the lower level, a kind of a basilica type uh, ground floor accommodates a future link of development for the underground of the new train station, which was then at the time of the competition highly criticized, but turned out to be a reality. Now it is 10 years later, that's exactly what they're going to be doing. They're going to be refurbishing the whole train station and activating its underground. And we foresaw that, proposed actually to activate a new street in order to actually uh, guarantee a, a secret link an extremely efficient link between that level of the train station we will become the main train station level. The museum itself is set not on the ground floor. You have commercial and gallery spaces here, but the main gallery spaces are set on, uh, on the upper floor, and this means a lot for the way we built up the images themselves. I want to point out here to uh, uh, the topographic relationship. I'm sorry for the contrast. You can't see very much here. You have the main courthouse. In Switzerland, this is the Tribunal Federal, the federal uh, courthouse. And on the other side of it, you have the Alps. So on one side, you have really this hilly and topographic uh, development of the city. On the other side, of the landscaping issues. Now, on a point, now that we've seen what the drawings were, the scale representation, I want to make a kind of a slight difference, and kind of a short introduction to what do we dealt with the images and representations. I want to make a difference between what images are and illustrations. I have to read this short text by Gilles de Félix Gattari, and I will get into the details, but I mean, try to get the spirit of it and try to see how it could actually be read in, you know, in the light of what the project is. And if you allow me, I will read it. Husserl speaks of a proto-geometry that addresses vague, in other words, vagabond or nomadic morphological essences. These essences are distinct from sensible things as well as from ideal, royal, or imperial essences. Proto-geometry, the science dealing with them, is itself vague, in the etymological sense of vagabond. It is neither inexact, like sensible things, nor exact, like ideal essences, but unexact, yet rigorous, essentially and not accidentally inexact. The circle is an organic, ideal, fixed essence, but roundness is a vague and fluent essence, distinct both from the circle and things that are round, a vase, a wheel, the sun. A theoromatic figure is a fixed essence, but its transformations, distortions, ablations, and augmentations, all of its variations form problematic figures that are vague yet rigorous, lens shape, unbelly form, or indented. It could be said that vague essences extract from things a determination that is more than thinghood, which is that of corporeal reality, and which perhaps even implies an esprit de corps. I don't want to get into the detail of this. I'm not a philosopher, but there is a, kind of a few things which are essential to see. This inexactitude, therefore, this inexact approach, yet rigorous approach to what the form is. And the, I think architecture is always dealing with those kind of things. It's never dealing with idealists, and it's only with inexact figures. And therefore, it's really important to actually understand that we are actually evolving not on theoretic figure, but really onto augmentation and variations of ideal figures. Um, I will start with you just to show you how the process uh, has been evolved and it led us to actually what the project was in terms of the, the illustrations. I would say in the light of this text, I would say illustrations are objective essences and I will show you how these images have been developed. So, what you see here is a caption, Galleria degli Uffizi, and what the image is, is really what the, actually the words are describing. Yeah? So this is the objective essences we're mentioning. And this is literally an extension, an illustration of what the words uh, of the captures are. The Carson Pierce Guard. La Galerie des Machines by Ferdinand Duterte. La Gare Centrale de Lausanne. The, the Great Gallery in Paris, shown here during the World War time, uh, not to be cynical about it, but to really show about the ordinance and the order of the spaces of the gallery without the artwork. The Manhattan Schloss Zimmerfurt, the Enfilade. USS Ronald Reagan. These are all illustrations. 
and the Alps. In a later phase of the project, these illustrations are brought to epitomic characters and what we call ideal essences in a certain way. So I'll go back to that, and I would say that this image, the Galera de Uffizi, is not the Galera de Uffizi anymore, but the knowledge, the trade, the forces, the place, the space, the order, the form, the nature. Brought together, they form images, yet inexact essences. And there I need to mobilize William S. Burroughs in order to understand, fully understand what I mean by that. The ease of identity, you are an animal, you are a body. Now, whatever you may be, you are not an animal, you are not a body, because these are verbal labels. The ease of identity always carries the assignment of permanent condition, to stay that way. All name calling presupposes the ease of identity. This concept is unnecessary in a hieroglyphic language like ancient Egyptian, and in fact frequently omitted. The definite article the contains the implication of one and only, the God, the universe, the way, the right, the wrong. If there is another, then that universe, that way, is no longer the universe, the way. The definite article the will be deleted, and the indefinite article a will take its place. The indefinite article stands for multiplicity. From the knowledge, we go to a museum and a department store, a structure and a context, a scenography and an enfilade, a morphology and a landscape. Brought together, they form proto-images, unexact senses, an interior. An infrastructure. An exterior. and a superstructure. Thank you for your attention. Hi, thank you for the uh, lecture tonight. Um, clearly there's an interest in sound in the work and acoustics, and that was even before the EPFL project that you proposed. There's the control of the water and the yep. deafening of the sound on the bridge. There's the horn that becomes the acoustic resonance of the train. Um, I'm trying to remember what the third was. The uh, stadium. The stadium, right? There's a, there's a sound absorption machine. Doesn't, doesn't, uh, it's all resonance and internal. So there's probably a, a deep thinking about materiality. Mm -hmm. And for someone who's also sympathetic and really interested in, 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 in an architecture of sound, uh, one of the great challenges is how to work with it, like prototypically, how to model not just um, in terms of the software environment, but actually testing uh, in terms of materiality, and then actually how to draw sound. As someone who's very, you know, the work that you just showed, especially in the last last few slides, the very uh, intentional use of imagery, distinct from drawing, distinct yeah. from illustration, distinct from diagram, how to parse all of that out in terms of documenting a thinking about sound. I was wondering if you could talk about how that is worked within the practice. Um, well, our relationship with sound is linked to our love for music. Both, you know, Patrick and I uh, have been passionate musicians before we're passionate architects. <laughs> so it's not so much a reality towards the materiality of it, which would be extremely interesting to develop, and this is something that, you know, was central to the project in Lausanne, for example, for the pavilions. This project is not possible unless the competence of the school is mobilized as such, and therefore the architects are only, you know, kind of a withdraws himself from the, the, this competence. And I think that was the whole idea of the project was all, almost like a political agenda. I said, if you want to do such a project, you don't just, you know, hire an architect, just mobilize the competences of the school, make this happen, and the competences will be then uh, the project itself. I was not really interested into what these objects would become as such, but really into, uh, into developing this kind of a exchange, essential exchange between an engineer and competences within the school. That's for one thing that I say. And then this interest for the, as I said, for sound comes for our, you know, passionate interest for music. Um, uh, I was a passionate uh, musician before, you know, I was not a musician, but a, a meloman, as we say in French, before I was really uh, into architecture. And I think it, it, it always comes back as such. Patrick has also studied at Berkeley, also jazz. 
uh, for one year. And it's always been central also to our interest of architecture as how to deal with those issues. Not so much in, into how te technologically you could make it really happen, but really how to use it as a, thing, kind of a theatrical feature, which is completely neglected by architects. Architects are mostly interested by plastic arts and, uh, and, and not really by sound itself. For example, I'm really mind boggled for uh, how much there's little research about, I'm not saying there's no research, but there's less research about what the sound environment of our cities are. And an Asian city doesn't sound like an American city. A European city does not sound like, uh, like an Asian city. And these are extremely interesting uh, fields of investigation, which have been, I think, to a certain extent, neglected so far. Uh, I don't know if I responded to your question, but it's partly uh, the Thank answer. You. I will just add something also. You mentioned, Francois, that our interest for immaterial uh, uh, issues that could be, should be, in our view, integrated into um, architecture. Music is one, or sound, let's say. And, and the other, I mean, as much as it's an aspect that we would like to, to, to integrate again, there are other topics like political dimension or social issues that architecture could trigger, like you've seen, for example, in the, the bridge issue. It's not only about uh, making a link, it's uh, realizing new um, encounter and possibilities in urban planning. So we are, again, believing, and that's what we are doing also with students at ETH, uh, putting certain immaterial aspects back into the game of uh, what a program in architecture could should solve in our view and not just uh, uh, functional issues like or functional being always performative uh, or economic issues. I'm, I'm just going to whip up the sound. Uh, <laughs> um, you remind me of a certain sound, grunge. Grunge? Yeah. I don't know exactly what this means. It has like a, but it feels like I've, ne I've know, never met Swiss constructivists before. <laughs> So th oh, that's good news. Now we have Switzerland. So, so, so my question is, who do you hang out with in Switzerland? We don't. <laughs> <laughs> See, we're so exotic. The thing is that we have a, you know, we're, we have an office in Zurich. Of course, we do have. We have friends in Zurich. Well, we're based in Geneva and teach in Zurich. That makes us ostracized in the French part of Switzerland. And on the other side, we are the only French teaching in Zurich. <laughs> so it's a bit of an awkward situation. But, I mean, I, I don't mean it facetiously. No, no. There's, as you were saying, the sociological, the infrastructural, mm -hmm. the technological, mm -hmm. the misuse. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. I, I, you know, I'm reminded of Olgiati's mobilization of the image. I, I think there's uh, mm -hmm. simpatico. Mm -hmm. But what you guys do with kind of dirty, evil, machinic things that hide in plain sight, uh -huh. I... So, but nothing cynical about it. Right? It's no, no, no. A, it, not at all. Yeah. No, I, I, super optimistic. Mm -hmm. But just so, like, who do you hang out with in Europe? <laughs> we feel so lonely. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Come, come, not come to at LA. all. We have a lot of friends. We exchange quite intensively. But it's true that. I mean, I think of maybe a brother, mm -hmm. maybe sociologically uh, constructivists. Yeah. Anyway, we are very you. interested by the work of Ivan Leonidov. That's why uh, Ivan up? Leonidov. It was also central. Also, Remco has played, a, of course, a central role to, to their influence. Before I even met him, I think he was a central influence to us. It seems obvious on many aspects of the project, and I think it's totally fine with us that we actually refer to him as such uh, at his best moments. I think, <laughs> and uh, Jacques and Pierre, of course, have had a central influence on us. But and and also, I would point out to uh, someone who seems actually m less uh, in line with what we're doing. But Hans Koloff had a major influence Koloff. in what he yeah. did. Yes, also. I wonder if there's another lecture that you give at another <coughs> time that actually doesn't deal with, say, sound and image, but maybe with scale and time. Because what, 
I kept thinking about as I was looking at the images, I was really interested to see what you were going to say about them at the end, was that there was this kind of historical, I don't know, space odyssey 2001 thing that, like, not just the floor coming up a la OMA, but these things that seemed to land abstractly out of nowhere. And it was because they, like the images of the sound, British sound machines that you found, mm -hmm. they were so big and so out of scale mm -hmm. and so abstract all at the same time. So the way that you operated with these historical entities to sort of weave them in, I don't know if I would call it playful like Michael was, but sort of sneakily wave them in, weave them into a building program, but mm -hmm. you'd find some kind of abstract... Uh, well, unexpected form that had a historical or not contemporary reference, which I thought was in the black and white. And so I'd just be interested well, in your I'm, I'm, scale you know, time. To be completely honest, this is, I'm, I'm surprised by the, the degree of abstraction because I, we, we tend to develop the things in a kind of a hyper-contextual way, I think. Except that this context is not limited to the site. The context is a much, much broader concept we want to understand. So Patrick was mentioned in the sociological aspect, the political aspect, the constructivist aspect. All these form a context. And I think if we limit that to the contextual aspect of what the limit of a plot is to the legislation, we certainly believe that the expectation of a client, a budget, a contextual apparatus, a plot does not constitute a problematic figure in architecture. And that unless the architect creates that problem, there's no question raised in the field of architecture. And if there is no question, there's no project. It's that simple. We really consider that if architecture does not raise a question, this is no architecture, there's no project. It just fulfills certain requirements that anyone can do that. And therefore, there needs to be proactive into defining that problematic feature. And that's also one of the reasons why we fall short of winning those competitions, always come second or third, for the very reasons that we overload the project with a series of questions and necessities, instead of fulfilling the requirements, we want to open them. And therefore, that's where we stand now, as a kind of a hyper-contextualized uh, practice. Yeah, also, adding to what Francois just said is the, and maybe also to come uh, about the grunge attitude. I mean, uh, um, it's true that a lot of Swiss offices had success in uh, recent years, and we've been uh, coming right after that, through competition. It's, uh, it's, uh, the system works well, so you have a... Uh, uh, an open and quite fair uh, you know, um, set of, of uh, programs that are offered for young offices to try and propose. And out of it came several offices during the last decades uh, suggesting and proposing very uh, qualitative, important buildings, more or less uh, well-built. You know. But the downside of this is that now you have, and we encounter that with our students, but colleagues also, um, habits of just uh, uh, defining good architecture as something that just basically fulfills a program. So it's basically saying, check, 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 here I am, I fulfill everything, so I win, or I'm good, or, and if I wrap it up uh, cutely or well built or whatever, then it's even better. But we believe that the role, and is something that is really controversial, let's say, is to question the program. And the best that the client can offer is think he needs something, make a list, a program, but that we and architects should come and propose something that the client didn't think of, or combine, or question, go beyond. And, and I believe this playful attitude still in a very realistic way. We want to build. We don't want to just uh, suggest uh, elements that question. And should be still a tool. As a, uh, is one of the elements that is across, I mean, in, in, in Europe still uh, uh, something to be uh, learned out of innovative process we see typically in, a, in other contexts than architecture. So I'm, I'm going to challenge the grunge comment just a little bit because I feel like I, I'm, the idea that you would solve a problem with the machine actually seems like a very Swiss ideal to me. I mean, if we're talking about LA and LA is grunge, then here we try to solve the problem of the machine. The Swiss try to solve the problem with the machine. But kind of aside from that, uh, what comes first? Is it, is it the machine? Uh, is that the impetus for developing the morphology of the project? And I use that word specifically because you're using all the language of formalists in your presentation, especially at the conclusion. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm curious, is that the wolf in sheep's clothing meant to deliver 
the architecture, or, or is it actually in reverse? Not sure I quite understood the, the fully the question. Formalist. Um, you know, any, any ism, I'm, I'm very dubious of any ism, to be honest. That's one thing. And then the reality of architecture is that at some point it takes a form. Face it. it yeah, this is any architecture at some point takes a form. The way it actually evolves, the way it actually comes about is the secret of each architect. But I don't think this either as a critic, as a kind of a stand. I, I, I just think it's really a state of what architecture is. At some point, you have to give it a form. You say uh, you're trying to solve the problem of the machine here. We're trying to, to solve it through the machine. This is just a series of projects of the last decade. This is not the whole uh, aspect of our practice is one thing. The machinery or the machine as such, as a metaphor, as a reality, as an entity, that performs interest to us. But it's not limited to that. I think the final aim is really poetic, to be, to be uh, completely honest. No, no. But maybe also to make the link with what, what I said before, uh, having all architects just fulfilling the program, it just left them with the facade. And we've been also working for masters of that, like Herzog de Mont, they really made it perfectly, like accepting that uh, you don't question the space necessarily, but that you give an answer for that, and we would like also to enter the functionality. And of course, there's a, an interest into what machines and uh, can offer and, and, and let, uh, uh, I mean, imagine, I mean, coming back to the first image of going to the moon, I mean, there's no necessity there. There's just a will, a desire to say, I want to go there. And imagine something that is not just functional, but even poetic, out of the machine. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.